Welcome to Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Tonight, Columbia University debates a violent incident on campus sparked by the issue of illegal immigration. We'll show you video of the event and try to answer the question, was it censorship by the politically correct left or provocation by the vigilante right? Also, we'll begin a series screening some of the best television reporting on race in America. Did you know the U.S. government showed this kind of training film to federal employees in the 90s? A visitor from overseas, perhaps someone with whom you've worked on joint projects, who has become your friend, may have ulterior motives in that friendship. And the mother of all web video sites, YouTube.com, fights a censorship battle of its own, even as Google buys it for a cool 1.6 bill. Now, first to that incident at Columbia University. It happened last Wednesday during a speech by Jim Gilchrist, founder of a group known as the Minutemen. The Minutemen are a private group based mostly along the U.S.-Mexico border that tries to stop illegal immigrants from coming across. They call themselves a citizen's vigilance organization. Some call them vigilantes. The university's international socialist organization and other groups plan to protest the Minuteman appearance by occupying the stage. But did they plan to actually prevent anyone from speaking? And who started the violence that we are about to see? Judge for yourself. 2,000 Mexicans on the border. The Minuteman Project. Footage of a speech by the head of the Minutemen at Columbia University last week where students stormed the stage in protest, as you saw. And if you were watching closely, you might have seen someone actually get kicked on the ground. So here is a clip where that violence is clearer. Now, those two video clips of the Columbia incident are available on YouTube this week, and it wasn't just the protesters who got the coverage there. Here's another part of the video where a defender of the Minutemen, a student, rails against the Columbia protesters. I think this is a poor representation of Columbia's intellectual capabilities. These people are animals running up on stage and attacking get invited guests, and they should be ashamed of themselves. And no conservative would ever act the way that we just saw the Democratic liberals act, charging a stage, throwing punches, kicking people. It's a disgrace. I'm ashamed to be a member of Columbia right now. And I just feel that that was a poor display of lack of civility. There's absolutely no reason for that whatsoever. Apparently a student, at least he called himself a member of the Columbia community. So, some people were outraged by the very presence of the anti-illegal immigrant group. That last voice outraged by the protest. With us now to look at this clash of free speech on campus and other issues of censorship online is Jay Rosen, professor of journalism at New York University. He writes a media blog, PressThink.org. Jay, welcome to Brian Lear Live. Thank you. From what you can tell, and here we are on CUNY TV with an NYU professor talking right. about what happened at Columbia. From what you can tell, did the students go onto that stage intending to stop Jim Gilchrist from having his speech? Um, I don't care. As a faculty member, what I'm concerned about is they disrupted a free speech event. They disrupted his speech. Disrupted is yes, enough. That's if they enough. heckled from the audience, that yeah. would be enough. Well, our job as as people who believe in the university is to create a secure forum where people can speak. And if it fails, it fails. So uni university failed, not just Columbia, but you know, the institution of higher education fails whenever somebody cannot speak. And so that's how I would start as a, 
as a member of that community. Right. Now, I saw the release from the, uh, the uh, international, uh, the, the Socialist Students Organization, and they said they've held protests before where sure. they have occupied the stage mm. to make a very strong statement against the speaker. But mm -hmm. then they left the stage and the speech went on. Mm -hmm. Here, the scuffle broke out, which they attribute to supporters of the Minutemen, and we saw that kick. I don't know who the individuals were, right. so I don't know who actually uh, uh, was responsible for the kick, right. but it could well have been somebody from the Minutemen organization on the stage. Sure. Well, the whole event, Brian, was really a series of provocations. The Minutemen themselves are a provocation. The invitation for them to speak was a provocation. The announcement, we're going to protest them, that's a provocation. Uh, taking the stage is a provocation. Kicking somebody, it's just one yeah. series of provocations after another. But the university responsibility is to say, we can have these people in the same room because we're in control of this forum and we know how to protect free speech. That's what the university has to say. And the students are part of that as well. Anyone from the Columbia University uh, and community, especially if you were there, want to call in with your version of events? We may not be able to prove anything tonight, but we can hear your free speech. 212-251-0801, 251, 251 uh, One user comment on YouTube summed up the irony of this, a comment attached to one of the video clips, quote, funny that those who protest the Minutemen in the name of tolerance are not tolerant enough to even listen to what they had to say. Liberal college kids are hypocrites. Mm. Your reaction? Well, um, if one of my students had been there, I'm sure they would have wanted to hear what he had to say. And I think that's a very important point. You said even inviting the head of the Minutemen to speak yeah. was a provocation. Sure, in because you know way? it's going to be protested by people who might, in fact, try and take the stage. For, you know that for sure. And in a sense, you're trying to provoke them because you're trying to show that they can't uh, prevent uh, certain views from being aired. And there was one part of the video, Brian, where the student who was angry at this action, justifiably so, um, decided to put a label on who these people were. And he said, this is what we see the Democrats and the liberals doing. And I thought at that moment, he kind of exited from the event and he started to talk about a kind of a national war, ongoing culture war, in which he immediately enlisted those people without actually knowing yeah. that much about them. How do we know who exactly they were and what interests they were representing? It's, it's funny because that video got almost half a million views on YouTube. It's and compelling. Of, <laughs> and, of course, this was you know, also widely reported on cable television, more than I imagined it would have been when I first heard about the incident last week. It, do you think that the protesters had widespread media exposure? And since somebody was videotaping the event, maybe even uploading on user-generated sites like YouTube in mind, to spread their message of protest against the Minutemen, or is that too uh, sophisticated? No idea. But why is it greater interest than you imagine? What's wrong with your imagination, Brian? What's, I mean, like, what is it that you didn't expect that happened? Right. Well, um, you know, it was, I, it, I guess I shouldn't be surprised or disappointed when the media takes an isolated incident and blows it up all out of context. Right. There are other things that we could look at with respect to who has free speech on campus. There was an issue involving Jews and Arabs at Columbia right. uh, last year. Right. There was just the decision to cancel a planned appearance by Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran. So what's the big picture here? I Which think. side is more responsible for, um, for, for blocking speech? I'm not taking a position that one side or the other is. I'm just saying mm. there's a larger issue to discuss here. Mm. And instead, the media just focus in, in general, on, okay, who did this? The left is bad. No, the right is bad. Yeah, right, because it, it has to feed a, uh, an existing narrative rather than generate its own story from what happened, and that happens all the time. But we don't know. I don't know. You don't know. I don't, we don't really have a good sense of yeah. who caused what. And also what gets lost is any real debate about the Minutemen and who they are yeah. and the legitimacy of their cause, yeah. and the real problems with illegal and, and immigration. And what are the arguments they're making to the nation? And That's what I want to know. Mm -hmm. What are the arguments that they're making to the nation as a whole, and to New York, to people in New York? Let's take a call. It's Hesham, did I get your name right, on Staten Island? Hi, you're on the air. Yes, how are you doing, Brian? It's the first time following your show on the, the, on the TV. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was watching Democracy Now! right before your show. Yes, I saw they also covered this tonight. 
Yes, and of course you saw that the head of the Minutemen was debating uh, this uh, student from Colombia, right. uh, the head of the political uh, campaign there. And uh, after the first few minutes, he stopped the debate and he left the show abruptly. Uh, I mean, in, in my opinion, that shows, and I agree with the, with the Colombians, that it's not about free speech. They just want to uh, have a pristine environment to further their agenda without opposition from nobody. Hmm. Okay. So, thank, to... thank you very much. It was interesting, and Amy Goodman uh, couldn't get an answer to her question, are you sitting there with a lawyer? Because in the middle of that debate, as you saw, Jim Gilchrist said, well, under the advice of my attorney, I'm now going to terminate my participation in this interview. Uh, I guess he said he was going to file a lawsuit, maybe including against the, uh, the student who was debating him, possibly for defamation or something. Mm. Uh, but then he took off his mic, and you saw color bars where, uh, where he used to be. Another call, Harvey in Gramercy Park. You're on the air. Hello, Harvey. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I heard on the Amy Goodman show this morning the uh, leader of the socialist group calling the Gilchrist person every conceivable name, murderer, killer, etc., etc. They said they had every right to go on the stage and do whatever they had to do because it was their right to protest these murderers, these crazies, etc., etc. She said it was not a free speech issue. It was merely an issue where they had the right to take protest to any lengths necessary. Now, that is a totally ignoring what free speech should mean on a campus. Anyone should be able to come on a campus and at least express themselves without being attacked, without being stopped, without having a mob surrounding them and drowning them out. Right. So I must have come in just after that because I saw the part that the previous caller was referring to. I didn't see this. So this raises a question of legitimacy of speech. If she's calling them killers and murderers, without evidence that they're actually killers and murderers, yeah. um, then, uh, then maybe he's got a libel suit. I don't know. Well, <clears throat> after he hung up, she then launched into a tirade, and I'm surprised that Amy Goodman allowed it because there was no rebuttal. The man had no opportunity to defend himself. Uh, the question, and she made the point, which I re reiterate again, I believe in free speech, no matter whether I hate the people or love the people. Without free speech, we have no free press, we have no free country. But the students at this place, at this time, made it clear that free speech was not on the agenda. What was on the agenda was the promoting of their point of view and the denigrating of the other point of view to the point of calling them all sorts of terrible names. Harvey, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your call. Um, what about that line? And again, I didn't see that part of democracy now, so I don't know exactly what language was used by that guest from, uh, uh, fr from the student body. But if she was calling them killers and murderers yeah. and things like that. Is that, does that cross a line for you, it's speech? Well, um, it's not a very intelligent thing to say to compare a group like the Minutemen to the KKK and the methods of the KKK. Just historically, it's not very accurate. It's not a very good description of the kind of group they are. And so that's disappointing because that's immediately out of the realm of, well, let's study what the Minutemen are saying. Let's study who they are, where they come from. That's what I would like to see. And you know what's tragic about this? Is that I would rather have seen the International Socialist Group people stand up and confront uh, Jim in their questions and what they had to say. That would be dramatic to me. That would be interesting. This is not interesting. And we did just look up in the control room the transcript of Democracy Now! and she did call him um, or the group murderers and racists for whatever it's worth. All right. Called him a murderer and a racist. Paulina in Astoria, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Well, I was just saying that I felt that I definitely don't agree with the Minutemen or any more walls. I mean, we take we, we take a lot of time uh, turning down walls in other countries. Why are we going to stop putting walls here, especially with the Mexican people who are one of the wonderful people that we have as neighbors? And uh, I don't agree with the guy, but I do disagree with the way the students behave because that doesn't allow us to stand. Uh, we have to argue properly. We can't just jump on people. It, it, it's not good for us. We lose that way. Paulina, thank you very much. And call here and argue any time, okay? Okay. Thank you very thank you. much. Bye. All right, next topic. This week's look at the world of web video 
comes with major news for the mother of all web video sites. YouTube was snapped up by Google, as I'm sure you've heard, for a cool $1.6 billion. Paying homage to their own success, here's how YouTube's founders announced the deal on their own site. Hi, YouTube. This is Chad and Steve. We're the co-founders of the site, and we just want to say thank you. Today we have some exciting news for you. We've been acquired by Google. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to every one of you guys that um, have been contributing to YouTube, the community. And this is great. Two kings have gotten together, and we're going to be able to provide you an even better service and uh, build even more innovative features for you. <laughs> I don't know. Just keep going. Two kings. What does it What does it mean for the What does it mean for the okay. user community? Get your hand off me, kings. Two kings have gotten together. <laughs> yeah. The king, the king, the king of search, the king of video have gotten together. We're gonna have it our way. You <laughs> <laughs> can't do that. With all the production values you would expect from user-generated video, and the user community was quick to upload its own video in response, here's how one avid young user reacted. Google wants YouTube for 1.6 billion. 1.6 billion. That's a lot of money. <laughs> I love it. Like, this is going to be like... I don't even know what this is going to be. But it's going to be big, and I love it. Media analysis of the people by the people. Isn't democracy great? Uh, Jay, what do you think of this? And, wh and what do you think of the way that these guys, we're definitely from a new corporate era, mm. if they can get bought for $1.6 billion, and that's their public face to the world, Chad and Steve? Well, certainly it's a different idea of professionalism. <laughs> Um, what's good about it is that it's emblematic of what things, uh, how things work at YouTube. They are part of their community, and they're showing that by the way they announce this news. You uh, said an interesting thing. You, you used the word professionalism, new, yeah. new kind of professionalism. In, in a way, the very existence of YouTube, thriving as it does on video that's uploaded by viewers, by anybody, rather right. than by media professionals. Right mocks the very idea of professionalism. Absolutely, yeah. And their video isn't professional. I mean, they, in other words, they're not trying to control every element of the production, as we're doing here, because we're professionals, right? They're not trying to do that, and that's a key point, because they're not trying to separate themselves from the audience with their superior grasp of media tools. Everybody has the same grasp of these tools. Therefore, media is not anymore about distribution. It's not about transmitting your message to all kinds of people. It's about sharing intimately with groups of people. And that's just a different direction for media to develop in. We've been covering user-generated and other content on YouTube and other web video mm -hmm. sites weekly on this show for mm -hmm. most of this year. Yeah. What do you think the real impact is at this point on media and for that matter on our society? Well, you know, let's go back to your phrase, user-generated content. I never use this phrase. I know what it means and it is the industry term for yes. what we're talking about. But um, that is the way the media uh, looks at it, because to them, that's what's significant about how different it is. Mm -hmm. It's user-generated rather than us-generated. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right? But from the point of view of the people doing it, it's not user-generated content. It's their life or what they think of to do when they pick up these tools that professionals have monopolized for so long. And so YouTube is one of the results of a tremendous democratization of the media itself to the point where the people formerly known as the audience, that's what I call them, now communicate with each other as much as they're interested in what NBC is saying. And that's new, it's different, and it's going to inevitably uh, create a new kind of social arrangements and, and, and new ways of getting together, and new ways of mobilizing attention. And, that, and we're seeing this evolve now. Is it a lot more work on the part of the viewer in a way that ultimately a mass audience isn't going to have the attention span for? I mean, if you have to search, if you have to sift through, you know, that kid we saw saying, oh, I don't know what it means, but it's big, well, that's basically pretty dumb. But 
if you have to search through these hundreds of thousands or however many videos are actually up there to find the thing that you want to watch that has meaning rather than the various you know right. 50 or 500 professionally produced cable channels uh, are people really going to do this in the long run that it's worth a billion and six five to uh, to Google oh I have no idea if it's worth the money you have to ask somebody who knows something about business no idea but um, well, I think the bet is slightly different than what you say it's it's that um, more people can be producers now. It's not, can, will the consumers stand for the chaos that this creates? It's more like the people f who were at one time just the receivers of television are now going to be possible to be creators. And so it's how to bring order to a much more open system mm -hmm. than broadcasting has ever been. So we have the history of closed systems, professional networks, and now we have the history of open systems in broadcasting, and they have to figure out how to do th something like just what you said, how to find the good stuff, how to uh, channel my attention, right? I don't want to waste my time. Search. And, pres and, and, and that is how to order a community, which is very different than just opening the gates and letting people in. So we're at that stage now, and we're going to learn how to order those communities, and they're going to be very different than a broadcasting setup ever was. Well, right before this YouTube deal was announced, another issue involving its policies came to the fore, and the issue, just as at Columbia, was speech and censorship. The conservative columnist Michelle Malkin chastised YouTube for taking down an earlier video of hers. Ironically, she makes her complaint on YouTube. On September 28th, I received an email from you. It said, quote, Your video, First They Came, has been rejected due to its inappropriate nature. Please refer to our terms of use for more information on what video material is not permitted on YouTube. The YouTube team. Okay. According to the inappropriate use clause of YouTube's terms of use agreement, I cannot, quote, Submit material that is unlawful, obscene, defamatory, libelous, threatening, pornographic, harassing, hateful, racially or ethnically offensive, or encourages conduct that would be considered a criminal offense, give rise to civil liability, violate any law, or is otherwise inappropriate. Well, I wish I could show you my little band video, which I created in February during the Muhammad cartoon riots, to spotlight the victims of violence committed in the name of Islam. There is absolutely nothing unlawful, obscene, defamatory, libelous, threatening, pornographic, harassing, hateful, racially or ethnically offensive about my three-minute movie. Unless you're a suicide bomb-wearing terrorist or insurgent sympathizer, I guess. In fact, the only people doing anything to encourage conduct that would be considered a criminal offense, give rise to civil liability, violate any law, or is otherwise inappropriate, are the jihadists I showed in my video, which is now, for some unknown reason, Banned on YouTube. Conservative columnist Michelle Malkin with her commentary on YouTube complaining about the taking down of her previous commentary on YouTube. So on a user-generated site, a site that's not supposed to be regulated by the FCC right. or be adhering to somebody's idea of professional standards, um, how do they set up, why do they set up parameters for what people can upload? I think this is actually a, a, a kind of gigantic tension in a site like YouTube, where on the one hand, uh, this place wants to be like a public space, meaning it's open to everybody. That's the greatness of it, right? Anybody can come, like a public park, like a piece of land that's open to the public. But on the other hand, they become also creatures of community. And if you watch the press about this deal with Google, it's all about the YouTube community, and people invoke it ritualistically. But a community suggests people who kind of believe the same thing or share the same life. But the space is so big, it's not a community. It's more like a public space. And so anytime you have an effort to establish a code, a rule, a law, you're either going to choose the values of a community or being a public space. Mm. And to pretend that you don't have to make those choices or that it's going to go away somehow is 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 right. wrong and unwise. And assuming that Michelle Walken was accurately reading the actual YouTube policy, it's very general and broad and open to interpretation if it includes phrases like, you know, anything offensive to ethnic groups or however they put right. it. Right. Well, what she actually did was lampoon how bizarre and intricate and 
ugly the legal code has to be to cover over this fundamental problem. Yes. You see, to cover over this tension. So she's making fun of the language, which isn't real. To so us. I'm guessing that now that a major company like Google mm. has acquired YouTube, which is the startup that's less than a year old, right, um, and has all this money invested in it, right, that it's going to get more restrictive rather mm. than less restrictive. Well, maybe, that? except that the whole value of the site is that it is a site of decontrol. So if that's your asset, and you go in and you start, let's control this, you've immediately started to undermine the value of your asset. Right. But wasn't there already an incident where Google didn't like some criticism of Google that was searchable on Google? Yeah. Right. And they moved against it? Well, <laughs> exactly. So you're, you, this, you run into problems like that inevitably as you decide to to try and impose controls. But on the other hand, the ideal solution is not to be totally uncontrolled either. And so the question is, what kind of organization is able to figure that out? And one thing Google is very good at is they let sites teach them how they operate. They, they watch them over time. And the users tell them how, sort of how the site is being used, and then they program that back into the site. Michelle Malkin wasn't the only person complaining about YouTube censorship this week. There was also an outcry when YouTube was removing footage of violence against U.S. troops in Iraq. The video showed graphic content of insurgent attacks on Americans like roadside bombs and sniper fire. Here is an example where the content is not so graphic. a very different kind of uh, material, obviously, than Michelle Malkin's commentary, troubling to some people for a very different reason. Does something connect YouTube's decision to take down both of these things? Uh, if so, I don't know what it is, and they haven't explained what it is, and they're not really set up to issue judgments and explain those judgments. And so when they do it, it's going to strike people as use of an arbitrary power. And if it seems like an arbitrary power, then immediately YouTube has weakened itself in a way because that's part of the trust of the site. And so this is not a small problem. This is a very large problem with the whole enterprise. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about footage of war, and again, this was one of the less graphic pieces that was up there. There were some things that, yeah. you know, really showed a lot of troubling carnage. Right. Um, uh, it often gets into matters of business and matters of politics rather than matters of democracy or journalism uh, so that the networks won't want to show things that are too troubling to people because people might complain and the advertisers might run away mm. or they're concerned about claims of bias because it's generally people against the war who want a lot of the graphic footage shown mm -hmm. so the public gets the idea of how horrible war is mm -hmm. right where it's people who are for the war who want us to focus on you know the pristine nature of the mission uh, uh, r r rather than the sacrifice being paid uh, well yeah uh, well I look at it a little different Brian to me very few systems commercial state up from the bottom, down from the top, are going to be able to be totally decontrolled and open. There's no such thing. And so there's always going to be a decision rule going on of what you allow and what you don't allow. And to me, that is always a political situation no matter what. No matter what. And so you, what you have to be able to do is make arguments for why you have these rules. And there's essentially political arguments. And, they, and they're strongest when you address a homogeneous community, because the community can agree easily on what we don't want to see and what we do. But when you have a space with lots of communities, it becomes that much harder. So it's always a political judgment. The question is, how do you ground that judgment? How do you get people to accept it? How do you get them to trust you that you're not, you right. know, filtering it one way and not the other? But I still see it as a business thing. That the only it reason is. that YouTube would take it down, especially in a vast, open, unrestricted space like this, where it's clear from the start that it's kind of raw source material yeah. that you're choosing yeah, to view. Sure, absolutely. Uh, that that they would be taking it out of, out of some kind of fear, and maybe no coincidence, just as about just as they were about to make their 1.65 billion dollars. I actually don't think so in this case. Not not fear of advertisers. No, because 
in this case, it's, the advertising isn't worth anything unless people trust that community to operate fairly. And I think it's more that there would be people in the community, so-called, upset than that it's than it's advertisers. And this is the tricky thing, because it's not necessarily good for YouTube to listen to one part of its community. Well, we will see now that it's been acquired by uh, Google how independent, how close to its open source net roots YouTube stays. It's going to be an adventure. Jay Rosen, thank you very much. Thank you. Coming up in a minute, we'll begin a series screening some of the best television reporting on race and ethnicity in America. This is Brian Lear Alive. Prominent professors, outstanding students, illustrious alumni, all on the Emmy-nominated magazine show about CUNY. Hi, I'm Dwayne Ferguson. Join us this Sunday when we'll bring you the stories about people and programs that make CUNY a place where you study with the best. Do you want to complete your college degree while balancing career and family obligations? Do you want a flexible schedule and a challenging curriculum? If you've earned at least 30 credits or an associate degree, now's your chance to finish what you started at CUNY. Learn about CUNY's online baccalaureate in communication and culture. Visit cuny.edu slash online or call 212-652-CUNY. This is Scott McLeod, and you're watching Art or Something Like It. You bring a line, I'll bring a pole. We'll go down to the vision hole. What are we gonna catch? I don't know. Art or something like it. Art or something like it. So we'll talk about that. This is Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. We've already begun this segment, only without you. Just kidding. Next week, a special 90-minute edition of Brian Lehrer Live. We will show you the event I moderated at Town Hall in Manhattan last week, Should We Get Out of Iraq, with Congressman Jack Murtha, former Senator George McGovern, and two guests on the other side. That's next week at the same time. Right now, we begin a series screening some of the best reporting about race and ethnicity on American television. The stories we will show you all come from a book and DVD called The Authentic Voice, The Best Reporting on Race and Ethnicity. It was compiled by a team from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and the Pointer Institute for Excellence in Journalism. With, we begin with some excerpts from a piece called Asian American. This originally aired on ABC News Nightline in 1999 when a government scientist named Wen Ho Lee, a Taiwanese American, was accused of stealing nuclear secrets on behalf of the government of mainland China. He eventually pleaded guilty not to any kind of spying, just to illegally downloading some documents. The ABC story looks at prejudice and paranoia in the perception of Asian Americans by others. The reporter is ABC's John Donvan. This is the fear that eats at Asian Americans, that when the rest of us connect the dots of some recent events, from Wen Ho Lee to the Cox Report on Chinese spying, to anti-U.S. demonstrations outside the American Embassy in Beijing, that this will feed a feeling against them that Asian Americans say is always there, just beneath the surface. Consider the May 26th edition of the New York Post. The White House selling out to China is the message. The president, caricatured as a Chinese man, is the image. Or this recent cover of National Review, Chinese Bill Clinton, Chinese Al Gore, Chinese Hillary Clinton. They've even got the buck teeth. Ever see Mickey Rooney in Breakfast at Tiffany's? The truth is that nowadays, no legitimate cartoonist or movie maker would dare to caricature the facial features of, say, a black person or a Jew. Flat noses and hook noses are taboo. The truth also is that Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans do not enjoy that kind of protection from ridicule. 
Only in rare cases, like the people in the film based on Pearl Buck's novel, The Good Earth. My father plowed it, and it's mine. Or Lieutenant Sulu in Star Trek, do we see Asians playing the parts of people we might like or might want to be like? More often, when an Asian has a part in a U.S. movie or TV show, it's to play the servant, Hop Singh on Bonanza. Hop Singh think maybe Mr. Ben Sailor Man too. Or to be the butt of jokes in the movie, Sixteen Candles. Would you like to go to the dance with Sam? Or most of all, it's to play the villain. Fu Manchu in the 50s, James Bond's nemesis, Odd Job in the 60s, and in the 90s, Angela O oh served on President Clinton's race advisory panel. I'm told that one out of every six physicians is of Asian descent. Now, we've got a program called LA Doctors. There's not a single Asian American on that program. You've got a program called ER. There's not a single Asian American doctor on that program. You got a program called Chicago Hope. You don't see any Asian Americans. Now, what does all this have to do with a spy scare? To a white American, it is not necessarily all that obvious why Asian Americans feel vulnerable in this period of troubled U.S.-Chinese relations. But it was finally hammered home when virtually everyone I spoke to told essentially the same story in different ways. That to be Asian American is to be told at one time or another that you're not quite one of us. Attorney Alice Young felt it when she was a child. But I specifically remember when I was in McLean, Virginia, as the only Asian family uh, in what was then essentially Pentagon CIA land, uh, that when they showed a, a film, social studies film, on communism, the communist happened to be Chinese. There I sat in the third grade class, and when the lights came on, all of the, my classmates had moved their chairs further back. At the end of the film, they said, if you notice anyone suspicious, please call your local CIA or FBI. Angela O oh feels it because she speaks English like the native-born American that she is. Anybody that grows up Asian American experiences, gee, you speak English so well, or hears, so where are you from? I'm from L.A. No, where are you really from? I'm really from L.A. So that was part of an ABC News Nightline report from 1999 on being Asian American. The first clip that we will show you in a series that will be continuing over a number of weeks, a uh, video that was selected by the authors of the book, The Authentic Voice, the best reporting on race and ethnicity in America. And uh, we will discuss each of these clips. We'll show you a little bit more from that Nightline report, too, in just a minute. But let's discuss it with two guests. Sharon Hom is the executive director of the group Human Rights in China. She's also of the, uh, the book Chinese Women Traverse the Diaspora, and Suki Kim is the novelist, her book, The Interpreter. Hi, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, so Sharon, what issues does that raise for you right off the bat? Well, I um, think that there was a lot of collapsing of um, Chinese and then Asian American, mm -hmm. which are very different things. And I think even uh, back in 1999 or in the last 20 years, um, Chinese and Japanese in this country have had a very different history, both groups. And then most recently, we have Koreans, South Asians, um, Vietnamese. There's just very different demographics of what Asian um, migration to this country has been. So do you think the reporter was doing that in the piece, or do you think society was doing it, and that's kind of what they were talking about? Well, I think he made choices, but I'm simply saying that to represent uh, Asian America and to use it in the program in that interchangeable way yeah. is really conflating too many differences. Because uh, really the issue in that case was Chinese Americans right. after the Wen Ho Lee right. scandal. But right. Suki, you're of Korean descent. Yes. Born here I was actually or in born immigrant? in Korea. Born South in Korea. Korea. So um, I, I don't know if you were paying attention during the Wen Ho Lee situation or if you felt that people were looking at you funny thinking oh Chinese at that time so is the distinction that Sharon makes meaningful in the way people perceive you um, I did pay attention to that that whole um, case and but I didn't I don't think I really felt myself as a part of that and and partly 
It might be because I was born in South Korea, so I always think of myself as Korean before American, which is a different thing. Although I'm becoming more and more American, and I'm realizing being American means um, actually it's, it's it's white and non-white issue. I feel more than um, just Asian American or. You know, it's or I mean, there's so many. It's not Chinese American or Korean American or, or African American or Arab American. Right. So, what issues did that raise primarily for you watching that? Um, it was heartbreaking. <laughs> Where are you from? Where are you really from? It's a very that's a coded question, and it's a very um, it, it breaks your heart a little bit because it, it right away takes away your entitlement. Um, you're right as as a as a part of the society, and and. Um, Immediately, I actually thought of, you know, right now we think of um, the, the Muslim population um, mm -hmm. as, as, as being a target of that, not so much um, Asian Americans. I was thinking of that same thing, yeah. how reminiscent to what yeah. Arab Americans and Muslim Americans of various kinds are going through ever since 9-11, mm -hmm. where the group comes under suspicion mm -hmm. in the very way that that report was describing about Chinese. Mm -hmm. Sharon, as someone who works advocating against the policies of the Chinese government, <laughs> Did the part of that ring true to you that said the Chinese government is active in the United States recruiting Chinese Americans to spy or make campaign donations in a way to il infiltrate? Yeah, I, I think that uh, it struck me as very funny because it is true that the Chinese government has active agents abroad. This is for rather public knowledge and they're in fairly large numbers. But to recruit Chinese Americans uh, is, is um, um, funny because in the context of ethnic Chinese, when we return to the mainland, we are always viewed with suspicion. So we will be viewed, the researchers, the writers, uh, people involved in exchange, uh, Chinese, ethnic Chinese journalists, we're actually targeted by the government for suspicion because we've been abroad. And uh, I, I too was born in Hong Kong and, and I don't know, I think I view myself, I'm not sure what I view myself as and when at different times. But so I think that that notion of suspicion is in our work less um, the question of ethnicity than the question of a government, you know, choosing what they're, who they're afraid of and creating these, these groups. And for Chinese in the U.S., uh, Wen Ho Lee was not the first case. Uh, there was a very long history of misunderstanding and misperceptions between the U.S. and China, which affected the way that Chinese people were treated in this country back a hundred years. And then even not that far back in the 50s, during the McCarthy era, um, Amy Chen's film, The Chinatown Files, documents really breathtaking and, and heartbreaking. Um, ten years of persecution of alleged Chinese communists by the U.S. government spying on them in their youth groups and, and singing you know, Chinese songs and, and that they were um, suspected of being uh, communists and sending money home, as all good Chinese do, we send money home to our village, was viewed as trading with the enemy, supporting the enemy of which we were not even at war. So uh, there is we some recent history. You in, get that absolutely In now. the Mexican immigration debate. Absolutely. That absolutely. some people are upset that yeah. there's so much remittance sending money yes. home uh, yeah. to support the poor communities at home by immigrants who come here to work. It's ever been thus in this country. Yeah. And the war, but it and, becomes and an issue right. of, you know, depleting our treasury. Right. And, and that actually um, act, trading with the enemy, comes from the, before the World War I. So there's a whole history of, ironically, of a country that is really a country of immigrants, yet we have, as a, as a state and as a government, has a very uh, uneasy relationship with the relationship of our citizens to the homeland, the first homeland. Here is more from that ABC News Nightline report from 1999, included in the Best Reporting on Race and Ethnicity collection. This focuses on another scandal from that same time. And fresh in their minds is another scandal with a China angle. 1996, Bill Clinton was running for his second term. Asian Americans felt he was sincere in inviting them to work for his election. I speak of allegations concerning a plan hatched during the last election cycle by the Chinese government and designed to pour illegal money into American political campaigns. And like then the campaign the finance scandal exploded. Famous the suspicion that a few Chinese Americans raising funds for the president were actually getting their money from China. The Democratic Party went into a panic, and suddenly every Asian American who had ever donated money to the party felt like a criminal suspect, contacted by investigators who appeared to be looking at anyone who had an Asian-sounding name. 
Millionaire businessman Charlie Wu was one of them. Democratic National Committee uh, had the investigator contacted me. So was Suzanne Ahn, a prominent doctor in Texas. The uh, questions that uh, this uh, gentleman asked was, one, what is your reported income on your tax statement? Two, what are your assets? Three, are you an American citizen? They told me that if I did not cooperate, they would release my name to the news media as one that would not cooperate with the investigation. And he said, if you do not, you will be listed as being uncooperative. We will return your money, and, and your name will be released to the press. So Wu got called, An got called, but Alice Young did not. Is that because she spells her name Y-O-U-N-G, the English way? And then there is Hoyt Zia, a Clinton political appointee to the Commerce Department, whose name showed up in the press in a story linking him to the campaign finance scandal. He was never charged with anything, but he says it cost him his future in Washington. In a blistering New York Times editorial last month, he wrote, innuendo can ruin a reputation in no time. The link to possible controversy was enough to cause administration officials to withdraw my appointment to a higher position in the Department of the Navy. I will forever have to explain to prospective employers why my loyalty as an American was called into question. Sharon, I'll go right back to you on this. It sounds like out-and-out -out racial profiling by the Navy, by the Democratic Party. Well, uh, I was actually having a different reaction. I was thinking that the coercive tactics of the FBI and the, um, the, 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 the fears of the U.S. government that there is Chinese interference in the U.S. electoral process and is exactly the same charges that the Chinese government is making about U.S. They're saying that the U.S. money is interfering in China right now. These are very current threats. I really heard it the other uh -huh. way. And um, so... Uh, you know, it, it's, it's in part racial profiling, but uh, many groups are being profiled, and it's not just Asians. And I think Suki said it was right that if you look at what's happening with Muslims now and what's with groups that are now under suspicion, um, that, that uh, it's a shifting group of targeted uh, groups that are under suspicion. Suki, John Donvan, the correspondent, said uh, in an interview about that piece that's in the book that it wasn't that there were so many incidents of prejudice against Asian Americans. It was that there was this widespread feeling in the communities of foreboding that prompted the peace in the first place. Does that ring true to you? Well, I think that um, his history speaks. You know, with Asian Americans, there was the whole internment and there was um, the Oriental Exclusion Act. So I don't think that you can ever forget that history. But however, um, as Sharon just said, that, that um, seems to happen for all different groups and it's in a way what it means to be American that America the land of dreams also has this sort of side effect but I'm actually very surprised reading this when I'm thinking about constantly is that it's true something about America from because I, I was I, I was brought up in Korea and I remember thinking of America as a white like a place where um, color you know you never thought of um, people who are of multi multicultural background. We thought of a um, sort of Caucasian mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. And part of that might be that um, when you watch, you see America through eyes of TV. I guess it's appropriate, the media. And American TV is really, really um, white. Well, you know, in the, in the <laughs> clip that we saw earlier, uh, the, the speaker was saying, you know, where are the Asians in ER, where are the Asians in Chicago Hope, when one out of six physicians was the stat she gave mm -hmm. in the United States mm -hmm. are Asian or of Asian descent. But that was in 1999. Uh, now, we were, we were brainstorming in the office before about, you know, Asians on television today. There are Asians in ER. There are Asians prominently in Grey's Anatomy, another medical show, uh, Sandra Oh. Uh, last, uh, the, the, the show Lost has an Asian-American couple, though he used to be a hitman or something, uh, that character. Uh, Deadwood on HBO. So there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Do you think that young Koreans growing up watching American television today would get the same impression of the United States that you got? I think it's possibly changing, but I, I don't think that has to do with so much 
the mindset of Americans are changing. I think that has to do with actually economic development in those countries. You know, Lost is selling their program to Asia. Mm -hmm. So is, I'm sure, um, Deadwood or all these programs. So whatever that um, can be aired elsewhere, they'll try to throw in a character who might, you know, that might be a little bait for a Korea to air this program, right? So I think th it's a good thing probably that their economy is growing, so they're buying American TV. However, I don't know if a lot has changed because when you, because those questions still do come, you know, where are you really from? Yeah. And I don't know when they'll stop coming. Sharon, you want to add something? Yeah, I was, I was thinking, Suki, that um, it's like when McDonald's is all over the world, but they have this, it is American, but yet they have teriyaki burgers and they have rice as a side dish. So there's an effort to appeal, and I think that's really important to remember the market dynamics and, and that that's, that's, that's really the, 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 the case. Their big yeah. new dish is the Asian salad, which yeah. is kind of like an, a regular American salad with a few uh, um, edamame thrown in and Well, my, my son is just oranges. in Japan, and he said that the, the McDonald's there, the whole service, it's a different cultural meaning. They actually give you the box, and it's beautifully presented, and the, and the meal was not like any McDonald's you have in the <laughs> U.S. So it was really, uh, yeah, that's true. So, so but, you know, the... the, the the, the hook there at that time in 1999 when this was made was the fact that these um, so-called Chinese campaign finance scandal and Wenho Lee situation were going on. So how did that affect the Chinese community? Right now, we have the North Korean nuclear mm -hmm. test. And I wonder if over these last few days, anybody who knows you're Korean has been looking at you sideways or whether that rubs off on the, the Korean-American community in anything like that kind of way that we saw there. I don't think so. I mean, just because I think that it's, I mean, it's hard to compare that. But, you know, something like 9-11, we immediately thought, okay, these are all our enemies on our land. North Koreans, um, they think of it as this thing that's going elsewhere still. It's somewhere far away, and this crazy dictator is somewhere, and he's, you know, th threatening to bomb. But it's not really touching on American um, the, the, the mentality towards how they view. I think that anyone who can tell the difference between South, you know, Koreans and Japanese, and, and they wouldn't be looking at me with suspicion. They'll think, so tell us about it. Yeah, I mean, people who know, mm -hmm. know that the, the Korean community in the United States is almost 100% South Korean. There is no emigration from North Korea. There would yeah, be no they don't get out. <laughs> give and take back and forth. You know, there's no, uh, there's no uh, potential political connection with, with North Korea. Among, but not everybody knows that. People aren't sophisticated so much to know that around the land. But you don't see it as a problem. I think that they still, Americans still do think of it as a completely uh, separate problem that it's some other country somewhere, that this bomb kind of has nothing to do with us. So I don't think it's reaching in the same way. In a way, it would be more um, interesting if they can see the relevance of the, I'm talking about the average Americans, yes. the relevance mm -hmm. of the threat. Yes. And what's the relevance like to you, just to you, as someone who comes from South Korea, seeing the news these last few days? I um it's terrifying not because not so much the bomb thing is that terrifying too I'm just surprised with the whole um you know the the whole whole notion of of the nuclear bomb that that the first time the first thing I think about when I hear nuclear bomb I think about Hiroshima and Nagasaki like I think of America having actually done um it. done it <laughs> used it on civilians so I find it very mm -hmm. odd that um, I'm not justifying North Korea, but I, I don't quite understand how Americans turn, turn around and make that into an act of evil Be when so they've indignant. actually detonated it on civilians. And one funny thing mm -hmm. to me has been mm -hmm. uh, all this commentary by the scientists that it's such a small bomb, it's only the size of the one dropped on Hiroshima. Yeah. Well, my God, what that bomb yeah. did. Yeah. Here is one more clip from the Nightline story. This is a soundbite of Clinton Energy Secretary back then and current New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson. Now, he is often mentioned as a potential first Latino president, but listen to what he said in the 90s about the Asian population. Do you think this perception that Asian Americans are being singled out exists more in the minds of Asian Americans than anybody else? Yes, it exists more in the minds of Asian Americans. There's a perception, uh, more than reality, that there is uh, discrimination that's resulting 
from this incident that uh, it's going to be tougher to get a job, to gain approval for uh, new work. Sharon, you watched these clips with your staff at Human Rights in China yes, I today. Did. <laughs> what was the overall reaction? Well, we have, uh, first, it, it underscores that Chinese is not monolithic. You know, we have Taiwanese Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese, American born Chinese, and we have mainland Chinese. And I think the mainland Chinese, I was watching them watch the clip, and they were having a really hard time. I could see them trying to grapple with it because they've been here less than five or six years, and they're, they've been here pretty recent. And the way that they view China, many of the people who work on human rights, is the U.S. is a country they came to as a refuge. This is a country that's democratic. This is the country to which you'll find a lot of mainlanders will not brook criticism of the U.S. So I, when Guantanamo broke, we had huge arguments in the office where I said, Guantanamo. And they said, well, if they were in China, these people would be dead. Or, you know, that I said, well, that's not the standard. You see, there's a different standard for torture. So they, they say really, what President Bush says. They, they, they were very, and I think now a lot of Chinese in this country from the mainland, you know, who viewed this country, particularly the over 200,000 or so who came, you know, after yeah. 89, are trying to figure out how can we be critical of the democratic country that took us in and that is basically racist and that basically is acting in an imperial dangerous threat to the world how way. How do we process all and of how these do we things process at the that? same time? And, uh, when I taught in China, they, when I would say racism in the U.S., they would find that incomprehensible. We're almost out of time. Suki, your reaction to Bill Richardson? Um, I think that's a politician speaking. <laughs> I don't know if... It's a politician um, who doesn't care about the Asian American vote, it sounds like. That sounds like the case. I mean, I think that when you listen to something like that, you just think that as Asian Americans, you have to build your power so that you will be count your vote will count. Sharon Hom, while you're here, can I steal a quick soundbite from you on uh, your perception of China's responsibility, if any, for the North Korean nuclear test? Well, um, if we're talking about perception, uh, everyone in the world, including the U.S., perceives that China has some responsibility to control North Korea, which is why China is given such a free pass on a lot of human rights violations. So um, China is perceived as having that responsibility and uses that position so they can get the free pass. Uh, China apparently has not had a great influence in uh, influencing uh, North Korea. Sharon Ha, Suki Kim, thank you both very, very much. And that's it for tonight's show. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. We'll continue this series on the best reporting on race and ethnicity in two weeks. Next week, a special 90-minute edition of Brian Lehrer Live. We will show you the event I moderated at Town Hall in Manhattan last week, Should We Get Out of Iraq, with Congressman Jack Murtha, former Senator George McGovern, and others next week at the same time. And don't forget to check out my daily radio show, weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC, New York Public Radio. Tomorrow morning... Will Congress ruin the Internet? That's on 93.9 FM and AM 820 tomorrow morning at 10. Have a great night.